what's up tribe how you guys doing go ahead and hit that subscribe button and i hope you like this video this is um your review for secrets of the chippendale murders now this is also on a and e tonight was the first episode so if y'all don't know what chippendales is chippendales is uh all male strip review like it's a very classy base now but this talks about the origins of it and some of the scandals that happened throughout the the history of Chippendales. It started in ooh, excuse me, it started in the 1970s. So let's get into it. So um we start this episode off, like I said, um they're talking about this the they talk about how Chippendales was about selling the fantasy of the perfect man. Um they were, you know, but there was a whole lot of, you know, sex cocaine murder the mafia all of these things came to play right so the the, the story starts in 1975 by a man by the name of Stephen um bannery he is an immigrant from um india right from bombay and he was like a, a custodian a service worker worked at a gas station but what ended up happening was you know in the 1970s we have this whole crazy disco scene going on in new york and he saw what was going on in new york and he wanted to bring it to the west coast because he was in california and he bought an old you know like a little club little hole in the wall club he was able to buy it and he immediately bought disco which it became a hit like it was it was a hit immediately because again disco was the big thing and everybody saw what was going on in new york and so now we have a club of our own here in la and we're going to make the best of it in 1979, he wanted to rebrand the club because Disco was dying, right? Disco was dying. He wanted to rebrand the club, make it a little more upscale. So the name Chippendales actually comes from the furniture in the club. Chippendale furniture. Chippendales. So, you got that. Okay. Now, a man by the name of Paul Snyder comes along, right? And he actually had the idea for male strippers. Now, Paul Snyder, it was a very flashy guy. Uh, they called him the Jewish pimp. He was a very sleazy guy that people really didn't like too much. His girlfriend, his, let's look at these connections, the Playboy. I'm not blaming Hugh Hefner for this, let's be clear, but I'm just saying the connection. His girlfriend was Dorothy Stratton. Now, we know that Dorothy Stratton was Playmate of the Year, I think, in 1980. And unfortunately, she ultimately was um, tortured and murdered by her boyfriend, Paul Schneider. So Paul Snyder gave the idea of creating a male, a, a male strip club. And they said, you know, it was the perfect time for all of this because we had the women's movement of the 1970s. We have, you know, um, women's rights and they were, you know, feeling their, their power, their control, their sexuality. And it was like, Hey, if men can have a strip club, then women can have one too. If men can have a place where they can go and let their hair down and, and enjoy, you know, what women have to offer, well, women can do the same thing. And so it played into that whole mindset of women, you know, and it was a hit. It, it was an absolute hit. Uh, now, Dorothy Stratton actually came up with the idea for their costume. She said, hey, y'all can sort of do the reverse of what we do at the Playboy Club with the cuffs and the, the bow ties. Um, and Steve actually got Hugh Hefner's permission to basically steal his idea and do it for men. And Hugh Hefner was like, go for it. So... That is a direct connection to um, Playboy. Now, unfortunately, in nineteen in um, August the fourteenth of now, eventually, Paul was was ousted because he was doing a little too much. It was getting a little too raunchy. Him and Steve were not getting along, and so Paul was pretty much ousted. But Steve kept the idea, so Paul was very resentful of that. And then we saw Paul. Um, same thing sort of happened with. Dorothy Stratton, they got married, but Dorothy, they actually were separated and she actually wanted a divorce and she felt sort of thrown away. I mean, he felt sort of thrown away um, again because he felt like he was the reason why she was so successful at Playboy. He was the reason why she was getting all these accolades and all these opportunities and money. Um, and he felt like she was throwing him away. And again, the Dorothy Stratton story has been done. There are movies, there are documentaries and all of that. But unfortunately, um, August the 14th of 1980, we know that she was tragically murdered by Paul. Um, and then he 
you know, he offed himself. Um, they said that Steve basically did as much as he could to separate himself from Paul um, to the point where he even acted like he didn't know who the dude was. You know, he was like, look, that's bad for business. I don't want anybody connecting me to him. Now, in the early days of the Chippendales Club, again, it was very raunchy. It was pretty much any guy who was willing to take their clothes off could get up there and strip. And it was no, there was no rhyme or reason to it. There was no rhythm, no organization, no, you know what I mean? They said it was just kind of everything was going everywhere. Sex everywhere, drugs everywhere. They said Steve used to do these things to get publicity where he would call the police on himself. Um, and of course that would make the headlines, that would make the, you know, and then he would play victim like, oh, the neighbors don't want me here. It's freedom of speech and women had just as much of a right as a man has. And how could they do this to me? They said that the people were on the lawn having sex and he would, um, you know, again, he would do things like overcrowd, like purposefully have too many people in the club and then call the fire marshal on himself. And he was one of those people that felt like there was no such thing as bad publicity. Um, but it worked. You know, because what do, what, what do people want to do? They want to go where it's forbidden. They want to go where all the rah-rah is. And so they said that the club ended up becoming like a landmark of of in New of when you go to L.A., something you got, especially if you're a woman, it's the place to be. You got to try it out. You got to check it out. It's the place to be. It's the place to be. Now, um, in the late 70s, early 80s, another man by the name of Nick Denora. He comes along now. Nick Denora is um, a children's television producer. He's won Emmys. He produced a show called Unicorn Tales. Now, Nick is from an Italian family straight out of New York. And I mean, like, I mean, straight out of Ellis Island. Like, his family came through Ellis Island. And, you know, Nick was um, a dancer and um, very much close to his family, you know, a family guy. And he went, ended up going out to L.A., because he had a deal at Hanna-Barbera. That deal didn't work out too well because they said that Nick doesn't like to share. He wants things done his way. He doesn't want to answer to anybody. And so that didn't really work out. But he sort of stumbled across the whole Chippendales thing. And he said, huh, this could work. I got an idea. So he ends up going to Steve and says, listen. This right here is great. This is a gold mine. This is money in the bank. But I have a vision. I want to turn this from a ragtag, whoever feels like they want to strip um, situation into a very polished Broadway-like production. And that's what he does. They bring in choreographers and they bring in costuming and they have acts. They create a show. So when women come, it's a whole story. And they said, you know, women are different from men. Men could care less about the story. Men don't need all the visual. They just want to get down and dirty. But women, women appreciate a story. And so they had the unknown flasher. They had Zorro. They had the barbarian. They had the construction worker, of course. And then they had this little bit they did called the waiter, where they would basically uh, pull a waiter um, who, you know, he's just minding his business, you know, who's serving his drinks. And they would turn him into, you know, they would coax him into coming on stage and he would play, no, not me. Oh, not me. Me. No. Uh-uh. Not I. And then, of course, he would get up there and he would be this great performer. Um, and then they had this other bit called The Perfect Man where they would, you know, take the parts of all of the different um, dancers. They would take one one's arms and one's legs and one's torso and they would create this specimen of the perfect man and they would act out this whole skit and they would have the whole pyrotechnics and everything and ultimately there is no perfect man because they would create this man but he didn't have a heart so there is no such thing as the perfect man right um then their perfect their finale was the tip and kiss and that was how they made the majority of their money you would tip them and then you would get a kiss. And, of course, these men were kissing 500 women a night, <laughs> you know, because the club was packed every night. And so that's where the main situation with the money was coming in. And Nick, of course, was taking a lot of credit for this because, I mean, he did. He, he created, he did turn it into this perfect, this specimen, right? Um... So they had the idea of taking it to New York. And, of course, Steve was down for it. He was like, listen, that's cool, money, 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 money. We can open up another club in New York. We can franchise it out. I'm down for it. So one night they're at dinner, 
And Nick says to Steve, he says, listen. And he writes this out on a napkin. He says, we're going to open up this club in New York. And it's it'll be same deal as before. It's your club, just like the one in L.A. is your club. But what I want is the rights to tour. And I want you to give me the rights up to tour in perpetuity. So forever and ever and ever. You have nothing to do with the Chippendales tour on the road show. Now, at that time, there was no road show. And Steve couldn't see the big picture, and he signed it away. He signed off on it on a napkin, you know. But listen, that is legally binding in court. There was an offer. There was an acceptance of the offer, and there was, you know, um, and that napkin is proof. He signed off on it. Listen, so this was sort of the beginning of... The, the end of this relationship because the the move to New York became very cantankerous um, because again Nick is taking more and more credit for the whole Chippendales thing and even though Steve is a very unassuming guy like he's not the flashy 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 of course he doesn't want somebody else to take credit for his creation and what he feel like he put all of his work into um so in July of 1983, they moved to New York. And that's where this episode ends. But what we do know is that by 1987, there is a murder where someone is killed and one of the partners is killed. Now, I feel like I know who it is. Um, but I'm going to just, I'm gonna, unless y'all have seen it, y'all know who it is. But I'm going to leave y'all in suspense as to which partner was dead. And we don't know what happened to that partner. Now, we do know that um, a whole once they moved to New York, a whole lot of things got involved, um, including the mafia. So that's pretty much this first episode, you guys. Y'all let me know what y'all think. Drop it in the comments.